Grace and peace to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Welcome and good morning. Today in the life of the church is called All Saints Day. All Saints Day is the first day of November, which follows after All Hallows Evening, Halloween. So this is the day in which we remember, especially within the life of the church, those who have died within uh, this last year, as well as those uh, who have passed away in our lives over the last several years. We remember them as well. But specifically, uh, we have families that are here with us to be a part of this. That's why we've got some, uh, some candles for us to light up front here today. Well, it's good to, to be with you on this All Saints Sunday. And I've got to say, I think there's a chance that I'm going to go diabetic after the enormous haul that my children brought home. My goodness. So we were walking, I don't know how many miles we got in, but we were on our feet for quite a while, and it was the daddy job to pull the wagon, you know. Next year, I think the kids are going to be walking on their own. We'll see. That might shorten the trip. But anybody else a little bit tired from walking around Halloween? Anybody do any trick-or-treating last night? We got a few. All right. Very good. Thank you. Alistair, I remember you did. Alistair was a bulldozer and backhoe. Bulldozer in the front, backhoe in the back. It was a stupendous costume. He didn't want to go on the wagon, so I said, oh, we've got to load you back into the tractor trailer. Here we go. And then he was up for it. So I'm sure we could tell Halloween stories all day long, but instead, let's go a step further into our worship by standing, and we're going to read from the Psalms together. So if you'll stand and join with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried out and was, and was heard, heard by, by the Lord, Lord and was saved from, from every, every trouble. trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, oh taste, taste and, and see that the, that the Lord, Lord is good. Happy, happy are those, those who take refuge in him. him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. thing. The, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. servants. None, None of those who take, take refuge in him will be condemned. condemned. Amen. And with that, I invite you to remain standing as we begin our worship with the hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
our heads and pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come here together and worship you. Father, I pray that you would speak uh, to the hearts of your people, uh, open them up uh, to receive your words today. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, 
seated and at this time I would like to invite our children forward uh, to the altar for children's time so kids come on down front and center Right. Today, like Pastor Aaron said, is All Saints Sunday. And that's the Sunday that we remember um, those people that we know in our lives, and especially this morning in our church, that have gone to heaven to be with Jesus. Now, this picture was taken at my wedding about 21 years ago. I think my Aunt Deanna took it. And Paul and I were very lucky that our wedding, we had three of our grandpas here. And these three men have all uh, gone to be with Jesus since this time. But they left a wonderful legacy behind. They were such good examples to Paul and I. Uh, they were very involved in their church. This is his grandpa Compton. And one of the things that he would do is he had a little dog named Coco that would perform tricks. And he would take that dog up to the nursing home in, in the town he lived in. And he would, the, he would visit all the residents and he would uh, show them what the tricks his dog could do. This is my grandpa Cecil. He was an usher in this church for many, many years, and he could fix about anything. So he would go around and help people and fix their washing machines and their hot water heaters and about anything he could fix, he did that. And this is my grandpa Newt. And he was a part of an organization that would collect eyeglasses for kids, or he would collect old eyeglasses and they would, um, distribute them to people who lived in countries that couldn't afford eyeglasses. So all three of these men lived out their Christian faith every day, and they set a good example for all of us um, who were fortunate enough to know them. I have a church directory, and this is from 2012. That was the year Ellie was born, so you guys were really tiny. And if I would look through here, there are people in this church directory directory. I see Doris Young and Margie Foley and my grandma Marianne. We could look through numerous others and find many saints in here that have gone on to be with Jesus. But when they uh, went to this church, they served God each and every day. Uh, they gave hugs. They volunteered. They did so many things. And they set an example for all of us of how to live our Christian faith. Then we can look in our Bible and there's saints in our Bible too. Saints we read about in the New Testament, Paul and Peter. And these saints are also part of our church family. The Bible is kind of like our family history as a church. And these people also show us how to live our lives and our Christian faith each day. So all of us are so fortunate uh, to have saints in our lives that have gone on to be with Jesus. But while they were here, they showed us how to live uh, the Christian life, how to love others, and how to be like Jesus. So today is a special day that we remember those people who have gone on to be with Jesus, and we, but most of all, we remember their Christian legacy they left while they were here. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the saints who have gone on to be with Jesus. Help us to learn from their example. Help us to serve you and love others. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're there.
they're finding their seats. We do have several announcements today. Uh, first one is that we will be having fellowship time after the service. Uh, that's going on today. Good News Club is also on. That's uh, Wednesday uh, afternoons. Uh, this next week, on November 8th, we will be honoring our veterans uh, here at the church. Uh, so if you're a veteran or if, somebody, if there's somebody in your family that you would like to recognize, uh, please bring or send a photo uh, of that person, preferably in uniform by the church office, uh, so we can uh, make sure that we celebrate them uh, next week. Uh, and speaking of veterans, Jack Weiss will be honored with the KPTS Channel 8 Distinguished Veterans Coming Home Award for his service to his country and community. Uh, the award ceremony will be televised on Thursday, November 5th, and it can be viewed on KPTS Channel 8 at 8 o'clock. So that's pretty exciting, yes. Uh, the next thing I want to bring your attention to is also uh, in the bulletin, uh, the ornaments uh, that we've been doing the last few years uh, for Ember Hope and the Youthville Foster Care Center. Is, uh, they'll be sending those ornaments this week. Uh, so please be on the lookout for those. Uh, each child was asked for something that they want, something they need, something to wear, and something to read. Uh, so if, if you guys would please take one of those ornaments, uh, provide all those items, and then get all of those back, uh, they'll be picked up by November 30th. So we have about a month here to get those uh, put together for those kids. So be on the lookout for that. As far as youth goes, youth group is going to be gathering tonight from 5 to 6.30. It's a time for all middle school and high school students to come together and enjoy a time of fellowship and learning. And all youth Bible studies will be meeting this Wednesday. Uh, there's a middle school study, a high school girls study, and a high school boys study uh, that gather each week. And everybody is welcome to that. So and for anyone interested in joining the volunteer base to run the online worship on Sunday mornings, Logan will be holding an online worship tech training. So she will walk you through Facebook Live and YouTube, how to work those, uh, work those technical issues. And uh, we just appreciate anybody that would be willing to help maintain the online presence uh, for our church. So We'll go to the Lord in a time of prayer in just a moment, but... Uh, you can see in your bulletin, we're going to be reading a scripture and going through a litany for All Saints, uh, for All Saints Sunday. If you are a family who's going to be coming forward to uh, light a candle in honor of a loved one, uh, the way that I think this will flow nicely is while we're standing for the reading of Revelation, if you, go, if you families want to make your way and stand in these front rows, that way when we call the name of your loved one, you'll be right here to light the candle. And then pull the pull the light from one of these candles up here these all have individual candles you can use to light for that does that make sense no problem no problem at all with that there are uh there are some prayer requests that we uh, have received and um, one that hits us very close to home uh, literally our next door neighbors the kitchens jim kitchen has passed away it was on friday late afternoon and so our prayers are for the, the kitchen family as they go through a time of grief and loss. It was, it was sudden and unex, unexpected, of course, so we want to be uh, especially compassionate and, and remember them in our prayers. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but there is, is it an election on Tuesday? Have you been getting things in the mail about that? Is every single ad on TV or on the internet about, uh, I don't know, Roger Marshall or Nancy Bollier? Yeah, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, but it's always good. It's always, always good to pray for our nation and for the leaders of our nation, and we are fortunate enough to live in a, in a democratic republic, I think is the social studies term for our, our government, and so we want to participate and pray for the process. I want to encourage you guys to vote uh, as the time comes. If you haven't already, I know uh, advanced voting has been out for a while. And so with that, Let's go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, how grateful we are that we can say that you are our rock and our redeemer, that it's in you that we place our hope, that yours is the kingdom and yours is the power 
and yours is the glory forever and ever and ever. It doesn't belong to us, doesn't belong to nations, to government, to politicians. It really belongs to you. Lord, we are so grateful that our hope extends beyond just the will of human beings because that will and that power would disappoint us every single time. But God, you go on forever and you are all-powerful and your will is all good and trustworthy. And so, Lord, we pray that you help us to trust in your will. Lord, we thank you for how good you have been to us how good you've been to us, not just as, as a race of human beings, but how good you've been to each and every single one of us. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would comfort us in seasons of loss, that you would bring healing to our land uh, across the country and across the globe. Specifically, Lord, we pray for uh, the healing of COVID-19, that it's a disease that would be brought to an end, that that would be swift and soon, and entire in measure. Lord, we pray for everyone that's affected by the disease, uh, those who have suffered, those who are in fear and anxiety of it, and those who work in the medical and science and comfort fields uh, against the virus, Lord. We pray for this. We pray for our country. Uh, we pray for the upcoming election. We know, Lord, that we can look to you in all things, and this election is certainly no exception to that. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you and we trust you, and we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of Revelation and the families for All Saints Day. If you guys would go ahead and make your way to the front while the reading's going on. Today's scripture is from Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one can count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the, the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, They are they who have come out of the greatest ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is this the word is of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Chad. And church, I invite you to join with me in, in a litany of All Saints Day. Let us rejoice and celebrate the pilgrimage of all those who have joined in the church triumphant. Help us to walk with confidence the road which they traveled. Jesus has called blessed all those who desire to share an abundant life both in this life and the life to come. We praise God for the victory that is offered all through the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us give thanks to God for all those who have gone on to glory. We remember and honor those names who have died this year. Alice Black.
Galen DeVore. Leonard Lindholm. Pete MacGyver. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks for all of those who have run the race with perseverance and now are with you, Jesus, in glory. Lord, we are left behind, still mourning the loss of those whom we love. But we know that you have walked this way before, Jesus, and that you have not left us alone, but have sent us a great comforter in the Holy Spirit. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to dwell in your Holy Spirit, especially with the families of the departed whose names we have just read and also with we who carry loss inside of each one of ourselves. Lord, would you comfort those of us who mourn? Would you help us to be comforters likewise to others, sharing the love and hope that is in Jesus Christ through his life and death and resurrection? Would you inspire us to love our neighbor, to love our family, to love each other, and even ourselves, Lord, just as you have loved us? Lord, we turn uh, the people whom we remember now once again over to you, rejoicing that they are in your presence, Jesus. And we look forward to the day when we get to see them once again in resurrection. Lord, we love you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's go. It is a, a practice uh, of mine to, to do a couple things. One, to make reminders for things that I have already forgotten to say, and uh, that time is upon us. If you, have, uh, if you haven't received one of these, one of these little communion cups will be... They're spill-proof. One of these little communion cups. If you haven't grabbed one of these, uh, just flag one of the ushers down, and they'll make sure to get one to you, or they are available uh, in the back of the sanctuary. We'll be taking communion all together. If you can just keep track of this for a little while, uh, we'll take communion uh, towards the end of the service. I just wanted to put that before you. Another uh, practice of mine is to let you know what your giving goes to. And I've been reading, uh, have you guys seen this book before? This is the Norma Souter uh, history book, History of the United Methodist Church of Cheney, Kansas, 1883 to 1980, almost 100 years of history there. I was reading that just this morning, and I want to lift up a specific paragraph. This thing is full of just gems and gold. I'm, my goodness, okay. So, uh, this is 1885, okay? No pioneer Methodist history would be complete without a report on Pounding the minister and his family. This tradition, uh, carried on for many years in most early churches, is described as a party or festival with members of the congregation coming to the parsonage, bringing gifts of food, often a pound of butter, bacon, flour, etc. Uh, these gifts were very welcome as many pastors in those days received a uh, meager salary. In the turn, the congregation did not have much money to give, but can contribute foodstuffs raised on the farms and in the gardens. Many times, the pounding was a surprise to the preacher and his family being called away on some pretext, then returning home to be greeted by a house full of boisterous men, women, and children who provided refreshments for the evening as well as pounds for the family. Now, uh, we did not do a, a pounding uh, this year, but October was Pastor Appreciation Month. And uh, Renee and I were blessed by, well, gift cards and cards and the like. Gift cards are much lighter than pounds of butter and cans of, of this or that. But 
I just want to appreciate our, help, our heartfelt gratitude uh, to you all. And it has been, it's been a privilege and a joy and an honor to, to be here through some tough times even, you know. And I can't think of a place, can't think of a place I'd rather be. So, so thank you all very much for that. There's one more thing. I'm going to stop blowing into this darn microphone. You know, if you ever have to wear these over-ear things, you know that can be a little frustrating. It's also frustrating is every time I touch this, the sound guy has to, has to compensate. So sorry, Alan, about that. Uh, one more thing. As we were uh, celebrating All Saints Day, uh, the saints, of course, are the ones who have passed on and gone on to be with Jesus. And what often happens is that uh, memorial funds are started, uh, and memorials go to different organizations and things like that. That's a very common practice. Just about every funeral I've been a part of has had memorials. And uh, if you did not know, we are going to be doing some audio and video upgrades to, uh, to what we've got here in the sanctuary. Uh, and what this includes is we're going to uh, get a new soundboard that's digital instead of analog, and mostly, we're going to increase our capacity and ability to do stuff on the internet, uh, to, to put it succinctly. If you've ever watched this on the internet, we do okay, you know, with what we have. But it could sure, this is kind of a, a new frontier for us. And so it's an area where we could improve. The reason why I mentioned memorial giving, the way that uh, the equipment and installation and labor has been paid for is largely through memorial funds, almost exclusively through memorial funds uh, that have been set up by people who have been a part of this church over the years. And so this is a way, and uh, this is a different way that a person can give, uh, uh, but know that this is one of the ways that the kingdom can be advanced is in, in memorial giving. And so um, I want to thank you for your generosity. And with that, I would like to invite our ushers to wait upon us for our tithes and offerings. pray with me. Lord, what we have, we give to you in the name of Jesus, who has given his life for us. We pray, Lord, that you would use these gifts for the forwarding of your kingdom here on earth, just as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
I invite you to remain standing for another reading from the Bible, this time from Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we come now at last to the, uh, to the last in the series on the Lord's Prayer, Praying Like Jesus. Unless you think that we have, uh, that, that I have designed this to be like the series finale of a long-standing show on Netflix, I'm just going to have to let you now know, go ahead and lower your expectations, whatever they might be. So we've learned about prayer uh, quite a bit, and I hope that this has been a refreshing a look once again as we've kind of dwelled in the Lord's Prayer for quite some time. We've learned about prayer as adoration, as, as adoring and praising God, and we've learned about interceding for other people and situations. We've learned about prayer kind of in its most basic form, in, uh, in not just intercession, but in petitionary prayer, praying for ourselves and our own desires, and knowing that, that God has, uh, has told us to, uh, even commanded us to, which we see even in the Lord's Prayer, as we've read together. We've talked about difficult things like spiritual warfare and how there are active wills that oppose the will of God that are at work in this world. And we've learned that God has already won the final victory, and, but there are battles that remain in the meantime. And we've also talked about what to do when God doesn't answer a prayer and when he doesn't answer a prayer in the way that we would like to hear. And we have read the same scripture week after week after week. I hope it hasn't been too uh, redundant for you. What have you noticed about that? We've, we've talked about all these different things. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, we're not sure if it's supposed to be trespasses, sins, or debts, right? As we forgive those who trespass in or debt against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, full stop. You know, it's almost like Jesus forgot the last part of his own prayer. Have you ever noticed that? What part has been missing this whole time? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And if you're a cheeky Lutheran, you'll add, and ever. You ever been in mixed company where there's an ever and ever? And then, Yeah, that's all right. That's fine. We love our Lutheran friends. In fact, in fact, I believe yesterday was Reformation Day. Any... Any uh, Lutherans in the house? Ex-Lutherans or Lutheran guests? Oh, got one, yeah, hi, Renee. Happy uh, day after Reformation Day. It's a, well, yeah, the big deal for us Protestants, the Reformation was. All that to say, this benediction that we have gotten so used to praying is actually not the words of the Lord, but words that have been added in by the early church very, very early on in the Christian story. And so what happened was, as was a very much a common practice in the day, they would take a text and then they would add a sort of a benediction to it. In fact, that seems to be what Jesus himself was doing in, in other places. And so the church did the exact same thing. They took his prayer. They added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, because it is a bit of a sudden stop to say, and deliver us from evil. And that's, the, amen. Whew. That's kind of a rough place to end a, a, a prayer. And so what happened is this benediction had worked its way into some of the later um, manuscripts that we get the Bible from that were written in Greek. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And then what happened from that point is a couple of English translations picked up that little benediction and kept with it, namely the King James Version. And guess what version we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer? The King James Version, right. That's what we pretty much all of us have memorized throughout the years. And so that's not to say that this benediction is not Scripture worthy or it's not sacred or we shouldn't be saying it in church. I'm not making that claim at all. In fact, we're preaching an entire sermon based on that. What I think, though, 
is that it does challenge us, this particular benediction, this particular conclusion to this prayer. Namely, whose is the kingdom? Whose is the power? And whose glory forever? Because there are plenty of forces in this world that would like to say what that ought to be. I was... I remember listening to NPR a few years ago. There's a, a radio thing they were doing in the morning, and they were talking about LeBron James. Uh, hey, his team just won the championship, right? I follow NBA, but yeah, so congratulations to LeBron and the Lakers. So they were talking about LeBron James a few years ago and this new tattoo that he got, and I don't remember exactly why they were talking about the tattoos that LeBron James has, but they were, and it was this. What we do in life, it was, a, it was a quote that he divided into two parts. What we do in life echoes in eternity. And for those of you who are movie buffs, will recognize that as a movie quote. That's right, we can't make it through a Sunday without a movie reference of some sort. Any ideas? Anybody, can anybody name that quote? What we do in life echoes in eternity. Gladiator, 2000, with Russell Crowe. So, this is germane, I promise. I'm not, just, I'm not just telling you about movies and stuff like that. No, this is really, I mean, it is a really cool movie. I think I won Best Picture that year, but that's beside the point. So, at one point, General Maximus Decimus Meridius of the Roman legions was about to, he, he was talking specifically to his cavalry, and he's, he's giving them the talk, like, and he's trying to encourage these guys. And he says a few different things in his British accent, which we all know that Romans must have had British accents, even though they spoke Latin. And he said, brothers, what we do in life echoes in eternity, 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 eternity. Like, oh, that was just brilliant. What he was doing is he was inspiring his troops to fight for glory, Okay. Fight for glory because your actions are going to echo throughout time. You will be remembered, which is a form of immortality. Kind of a bummer form of immortality, though. I, I don't want to be remembered forever. I want to actually live forever, which, hey, so far for all of us in the room, so far so good, right? I just want to live forever. I think that's a Yogi Berra-ism. So fight for glory was the challenge that Maximus gives. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Fight for the glory of Rome, even. Rome. Rome where Caesar rules supreme. Psalm 146 says, do not put your trust in princes. Because eventually, they're going to die. And everything that they work for will also fade away too. I say this uh, in reference to, well, the election that we have coming up. There are forces in this world, maybe even uh, a desire for political power that would say that the power and the kingdom and the glory, well, it belongs in, in my uh, political party or my political party. Or maybe it belongs to the country more broadly but I'm challenged by this benediction that we read each and every week, that we pray each and every week. For thine is the glory and the power. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, why would this have been a big deal? Well, Caesar was still emperor in the days of Jesus. And on his coinage, on the money that was printed was a saying that Caesar is Lord. In fact, Caesar claimed to be divine. There was what's called the cult of the emperor. You would worship the emperor, which is a very uh, smart political move, right? You know, you want your people to listen to you. Well, if you declare yourself God or godlike or divine in some way, shape, or form, they're perhaps more apt to do that and to take your word seriously. And so exactly that is what Caesar has done. Now, for those who have been following the one true God, namely the, the people of Israel, the Jews, that's going to be a problem because there is only one God and we believe him to be the one true God of all time. We call him Yahweh, although if you were, uh, if you were a Jew, you would not pronounce the name of God out of reverence. And that continued to be true through the days of Jesus. 
And so one day what happened was Jesus was teaching and some Pharisees sent some folks, some Herodians, to try and trap Jesus, to get him into some real trouble, either with the state or with the religious authorities. Maybe you remember this story. They, they arrived there, and Jesus is sitting down, and maybe he was teaching. The, the Gospel of Matthew doesn't tell us exactly. This is in the story uh, that Matthew wrote down. And they really butter Jesus up, which just reminds me of a politician, you know, in, the, in kind of the greasy sense of politics. Uh, if you ever met politicians, they're not bad people, but they are human people too, you know. And they say, oh, Jesus, you speak the truth. You regard everyone or you regard no one with deference and make no distinction between people who are up high and people who are down low. And so, is it right to pay your taxes or not? Oh, man. You can kind of feel they're buttering up, you know, they're doing, and then they come in with a, with a sucker punch. And what a trap that is. Is it right or not to pay your taxes? And don't you wish Jesus would have answered that a different way than he did? So here's the problem. This is a dilemma, right? If Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes, well, then that seems to be uh, giving in to a governance who says that there is a false God and you are going along with it. And if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, then the Pharisees are going to say, hey, Caesar, he's not paying his taxes. You need to arrest him. Can you see the trap now? And it's been set, actually quite cleverly set at that. And so Jesus' response is once again just exasperatingly brilliant, just out of this world brilliant. The first thing he does, do you remember what he does? He says, somebody bring me a coin. This is great, I love this. So someone flips him a coin, hey, thanks. And it would have been one of the Roman coinage. And on that, whose head is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's. Well, interesting, you fellas have this money on you, this money which is sacrilegious, worshiping a false god, and you're using this for your, your lifeblood, for your currency. Interesting that you're trying to catch me in this trap that you yourselves are already hypocrites in. He doesn't say any of that, but that is the implied message by the very fact that these folks have this currency on them. But he famously says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You remember the rest of it? Give to God what is God's. That's right. And so, boy, there's a lot to ponder there, isn't there? First of all, he seems to be saying, yeah, go ahead. You pay your taxes. You do your civic duties to the state. And by the way, that's, that's their right. And in, the, in a Christian worldview and in a Jewish worldview, those who are in power have power only because it is derivative from God. Otherwise, there would be no human power in the first place. So there is a sense in which authorities have been put there by the permissive will of God. So Jesus doesn't seem to be saying, let's start a revolution, grab the torches and pitchforks. He's not saying that, fascinatingly. And at the same time, he's saying, give to God what is God's. Well, what is God's? Everything, everything, everything in the world, and in the entirety of the cosmos belongs to God. So we ask this question, whose kingdom, whose power, whose glory? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So in this message, we seem to be given uh, the idea that uh, a follower of Jesus can attend to their civic duties and to do so with a clear conscience, right? That includes things like paying taxes, I would, I would say we could probably extrapolate further from there. Uh, jury duty. Has anybody ever been called up for jury duty? You've probably gotten notices. Maybe you haven't actually made it that far. Things like jury duty, even signing up for the draft. I will say, uh, w if you want to know my own like, political philosophy, you don't need to hear that from the pulpit, but I think I can say as, as much as this, that we have the advantage of being United Statesians, Americans, of being part of a nation that is for the most part been pretty good. Every nation is not without sin. And I know that there is a significant movement that would say otherwise, otherwise, but for the most part, to serve this country is generally to serve a pretty good nation. There have certainly been places of greater despotism than the United States. I think that's a pretty fair statement to say. 
So we can do that knowing that we're not serving the Roman legions, but that we're serving uh, a different nation, which owes its roots, I think, to cultural influence of the church and of Christianity. But that's social studies. That's history class. That's not necessarily a Sunday morning sermon that we're going to go into. But we still have this question that we have to answer. How do we make sense uh, of politics? How do we as Christians interact with the world that we are given? Because the fact of the matter is, is that there is a sense in which God's kingdom is already here already here on earth. Jesus came to establish his kingdom, and hallelujah, he has done so. And we see this most evidently in the cross. He has died for the sins of the world, and because of that, we are given life in his name. We can be justified in the name of Jesus and all of our sins forgiven if we choose to accept him as our Savior and if we follow him. And so, there are those who dedicate themselves to following Jesus, and, and, and we see that God is at work in the world and doing mighty and powerful things. But at the same time, this world is messed up. The world in which we live is messed up. Even us followers of Jesus who have been forgiven our sins, hallelujah, guess what? We're still messed up too, even at our best. Even at our best. Has anybody ever been hurt by people from the church or disappointed by people from the church? It, it's endemic. This sin condition is universal, and even though sin has been defeated in those who follow Jesus, it's not gone until the kingdom arrives in its fullness, when Jesus comes back and there is resurrection. But until then, we've got to figure out, how do we live in a fallen world? There's a couple of options here. You could take the Amish option, so-called. This is where you you set up a society kind of outside of the greater world. You don't involve yourself in the, in the business of nations. Uh, and fortunately, our own nation allows for that with uh, conscientious objectors and things like that, right? And so that's one option. People will see that you are a shining light in this society that you have set up, and they will, they will want to go to that, Okay. There are other models that say, well, this is the kingdom of God and this is the kingdom of man and you live in two worlds and so you act this way in one world and this way in another. Well, I, I think that, that, uh, that the word for that is bifurcation, meaning that it's been split. Uh, I don't think that's an option that we want to go down. There's another, another model that says, you know what? Let's just go exactly through the way of the world, the way the world works, because we see God at work everywhere and therefore everything must be okay and good. And so we kind of baptize the culture. This is uh, a little, the abbreviated version. But, but the problem with that is then, if the world's messed up and fallen, you're saying things are good that are, in fact, not good. And so if you're going to use the reins of power to influence people that way, you're going to be bringing down a lot of bad stuff. Well, what I think is in our Methodist Wesleyan heritage would be more like this, that Christ has come to redeem, and that Christ redeems even culture as well. So what does that mean? That means that, yeah, God is at work everywhere. It doesn't mean that we need to set up alternate Christian societies everywhere that we go, but that we need Christians in society everywhere we go. Do you hear the difference there? We don't necessarily need more uh, Christian politicians or Christian lawyers or Christian movies or Christian and then fill in the blank. We need more lawyers who are followers of Jesus. We need more politicians who are Christians. We need more people who are influencers in our, in our, even our pop culture who are Christians and followers of Jesus. And in doing so, we will see the light of Christ spread in positive and good ways. And I think that perhaps the reason why our society is as messy as it is, is we've become increasingly secular. And what Christians have done is they have withdrawn uh, from these different areas, and society's all the worse for it. So I would encourage that if you are, oh, thinking that you want to go into some form of, of ordained ministry, but you also have a big passion for something that's, like, not ordained, if you, if you really, really want to be a dentist, but you feel like you should be preaching somehow, declaring the word of God, those two things are not incompatible, that you can be a follower 
of Jesus and have a vocation, a job that is not necessarily just pulpit ministry. Okay, and if you're called to pulpit ministry, God bless you and let me know because that would be amazing. I'd love to talk to you about that as well. So we've talked about how we know that there's more to this world than the reins of power in American, in American politics. And the truth is that on a Christian worldview, we're not at home in either of our American uh, political parties. We know that uh, Jesus was not a Democrat. Also, Jesus was not a Republican. And that should make us a little bit uncomfortable. We don't fit into the, the two-party system very tidy. And I'm not supposing that we ought to make a third party for Christians only or anything like that. My point is this. There need to be Christian Republicans and Christian Democrats. And so, regarding the election coming up, I would say be free to enact your civic duty and responsibility and make sure to vote if you haven't already done the advanced balloting thing. And vote for uh, the, the candidates that will pursue good and virtue. You know, that's, and uh, the ones that the Lord has enlightened onto your conscience. You've got to be careful. If I say much more than that, we'll lose our 501c3 status. We won't be tax exempt, and the finance committee will be very upset at me. Be honest. I don't think there's any risk of that. But, but no, that, I want you to feel free to, it's, it is not going against the Bible to, to vote in the American system of politics. And the kingdom doesn't belong to Joe Biden. The kingdom doesn't belong to Donald Trump or any other politician. And it belongs to God, who is the king. All right, lastly, so what can we do about all this stuff, okay? So we know we can go and do our civic duties. That's all well and good, but what can we do? Well, gee, if only there was a current theme running through the last seven or so weeks of this sermon series that we could learn from, which would inform how we can live our lives. Oh, wait, we could pray. That's right. Pray. Those of you that said the word prayer, I'm so proud of you with me. We can pray. We can pray for our nation and its leaders. Absolutely. That is always a good thing. That is a biblically mandated thing. That is a, it is a good thing to pray for our country, to pray for any country and its rulers, wherever you go. Even if you're in a country that persecutes uh, Christians, it is good to pray for the nation and its leaders. So with that, I propose that we do exactly that, and we do it right now. You guys ready? We're going to pray for our nation. All right, let's pray. Lord, we lift up before you now our beloved nation, the United States of America. We name before you that we are going through an election which feels about as contentious and momentous as ever we can remember. Lord, we trust our nation over to you. We know that you are good we know that you have dwelt with Christians in this country uh, as with all countries around the world, and so we pray that you continue to do that um, through election day and beyond. Lord, we pray that uh, not just the presidential election, but all elections, both national and local, uh, would be influenced by you and brought about because of your will. Lord, we love you and we trust you. We we pray, Lord, that you would turn us as a nation back towards yourself. We pray that you would help us uh, to be witnesses in all of our places in life. In whatever our jobs, our vocations may be, may we be shining witnesses to the love of Jesus Christ. And may that witness carry over across the entire country for the good. Lord, help us to, to love our neighbor. That is a, dis a difficult calling. Help us to forgive, Lord, in our prayer lives. We pray that you would continue to, to quicken us to prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We, we trust you. We turn our hearts over to you, and we turn this nation over to you, Jesus, that you would work mightily and perfectly. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, it is time for this. So if you have your uh, communion cups, I'm going to grab a hymnal down here. Don't open them just yet, but the time is fast upon us. If you put it in your purse, go ahead and grab it and get it back out. 
I'm going to turn to the appropriate page in the hymnal. By the way, if you didn't know, we do have a stack of hymnals uh, just in the back uh, on, a, on a stand. So if, you, if you're the kind of person that really wants a hymnal each week, what we do is you can take it off the stand, just leave it in the pew when you're done, and we'll take it. And the way we're supposed to do it with COVID is we're supposed to quarantine these things. I guess hymnals can get COVID too. It's, just, well, it's a precautionary measure. You guys know how that works. All right, the appropriate page. The Lord be with you. All right, we're going to try that again. <laughs> I know, I know these are not very exciting, guys, but you know what? It's what we have for now. This is the body and blood of Christ, which is broken and poured out for you. Christ uh, invites us to his table with all the saints who have gone on before, whom we remember in memoriam just today. We're all gathered here in this time, in this place, they who have gone on in glory, and us here and in spirit with all Christians around the world. So we're going to try this again. The Lord be with you. Yes, Jesus. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which the Lord gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, Allah, all of us gathered here and all who participate in the Lord's Supper. Drink this as often, uh, as often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves. I want you. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Jesus comes back in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. With the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. In temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Because there is one church, there is one loaf and one cup. And so, friends, I invite you to participate, to take and eat and drink the body and blood of Christ broken and poured out for you. We do have little trash cans um, on your way out, you'll notice, by the doors. When you're done with that, I invite you to stand and we will join in our closing hymn together.
rejoice because who is king? The Lord is king. That's right. And so receive this benediction. May you go knowing that the king and his power and his glory are with him enthroned on heaven and a portion of that through his Holy Spirit now dwells with you as you go back out into the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.